I'm here from Wessex. My name is Alex Grassum and this is my colleague Angela. Um, and we're here to talk about quantity diversity and our journey from that to a programme called Fairness, Inclusion and Respect. Why are we here? Well, like the previous speaker, I attended the session last year, uh, the CPD session for quality and diversity. My interest in it was sparked because I've been asked to do a couple of university talks and talking to students about going into commercial archaeology professional. And it got me thinking about, well, what world are they coming into? I've been working in it for about 12 years by that point, and you sort of get in a little bubble and you carry on working. And so I started looking at the statistics, quite like statistics myself, and um, it was interesting, the work, wonderful work of profiling the profession and seeing how many women are working versus men, that kind of thing. Um, and then there was some more um, statistics shown at that equality and diversity session from academic institutions. But the one thing I realised was that wasn't there was a really drilled in survey of the commercial archaeology sector, who makes up our profession. And then I went back to work afterwards, all really fired up and spoke to Angela and a couple of other people and we, we were sort of allowed really to set up our own mini working group to start exploring it. And had a lot of great support from all the way from the top of the company. So what did we decide to do? Well, we needed to capture some data, really. I know, sort of, from the previous speaker, there's that kind of side, oh gosh, it's, you know, why do we need stats? Well, you know, it's going to have to be a survey because we have our own perception, an idea of who we are, but it's worth proving it. So the questions we sort of got were what sort of survey, what questions should we ask, how can we encourage participation, and how do we ensure that individuals um, information was protected, and last of all, what are we going to do with the results when we've got them? There's lots of surveys, so we weren't sure, we sort of talked about it and we thought, well, are we going to do a paper survey, are we going to do an online survey, what sort of questions are we going to ask, how big is it going to be? The main thing was encouraging participation and protecting that information that came back, which is why we went for a survey monkey, a digital survey in the end. We just couldn't trust that all the paper would be flowing out of our offices. We've got about 280 employees at Wessex at the moment. Most of them are not working in the office, most of them are out in the field all the time. A lot of paperwork coming and going. So we just needed to make sure that that was safe. So digitally, capturing it back, completely locked down, was the best way we felt for that. Um, we, th there's also an issue with that as well as actually getting people to find the digital survey. Most people have got a work email, but not everybody. But also people from the field aren't necessarily going to be logging off the work emails. Why should they leave and why should they be weekends? So these were all going to be issues to, to challenge us. I, I had the dubious task of actually drawing up the survey and working out what questions to ask and I found that very difficult. Um, I think I overthought it on many occasions. <laughs> and I, I bless the, uh, the patience of my colleague here. <laughs> because it was really hard to frame questions and work out how, what should we be asking, how deep could we go, and how much could we pry into people's private lives, and is it worth us prying as well? Um, but we did decide that we'll, you know, we'll, we'll ask as much as we can, but also give people the option to go, prefer not to say. You know, you know, every single question they did not have to answer. And I, I'm a researcher, that's what I do for a living, so I went online and found loads of examples, and I picked the best bits that I liked out of them. I liked the different sort of things here. I thought, I like that one's phrase, I don't like how that one's phrase, and I pulled it together. Um, one thing I did decide to do, having seen a couple of really good examples, was as well as it being kind of a tick box exercise of saying who people are, I wanted to get some ideas of people's thoughts and opinions and experiences as well. So the, the questionnaire when it finally came out was split into two. So sort of people ticking what they, you know, who they felt they were. But then also, within their work specifically at Wessex, what, any issues that they come across, did they feel they were treated fairly, have they seen any issues, and sort of given on a strongly disagree to disagree scale. Well, what did we learn after it all? Well, not, well, nothing we didn't expect really. You know, we, oh, uh, what are they working at now? There we go. You know, the vast majority of the staff took part are white. British born. And not many of them really signed up to say they would sort of put themselves disabled. You did, but you know. We are nearly 50 50 male female, female splits in Wessex, actually. Um, and there's a reasonable distribution now across the, the scales because we ask people to job grade within that as well. Um, 
I put here that the age distribution was the economic pattern. I don't know why I use the economic pattern there. Um, it's probably the wrong word, but what I'm saying is that there's a sort of the age sort of goes in the normal sort of bell curve, really. Um, the proportion of staff feel comfortable to identify themselves as being LGBT. And other questions we asked, you know, some have families, uh, some are married, some are in long term relationships. Um, other people also volunteered that they had a dog. Um, somebody said that they you know, divorced. Um, people were able to declare other medical issues they've got as well. So some people actually said explicitly, you know, they've got dyslexia or dyspraxia or were suffering from mental health issues. So that was quite nice that people felt confident that they could do that. What else have we learned? We also established that, on the whole, we're, we're doing okay at Wessex. We're not, we're not going to stand here and say we're perfect because, you know, I don't think that we are and I don't think anybody would. Um, not many believe they have experienced um, themselves or observed any discrimination. There is a caveat to that, though, actually. Most also felt they knew what to do if they saw discrimination happening as well, which was good. And finally, the last question I asked on the survey was, did they, did they actually think, you know, would they agree that the survey was important to do at all? And most said yes, actually, they thought it was good. Um, we did... Um, so participation rates, um, such a survey, right, I'm going to scoop on and then I'm going to pop back again in a minute. In the end, we had 127 respondents out of about 280, 85-ish staff, um, which is about 45%. So, yeah, all right, not perfect. Of that, about 37 of those 127 respondents, so that's about 27% were the technician grade. Um, we were talking about this morning, we think probably about 35 to 40-ish percent of our staff are probably at technician grade, so there's a gap there, obviously, of people who responded. Um, we also received some specific comments about the structure of the survey, and I did make some mistakes in it. I will hold up my hand. Um, one thing I failed to put in as a category was asexual. I'll use the latter as well. Um, one big debate, and this raged on an entire afternoon in my office, was is there such a difference between being an atheist and having no belief? I was ready to put my head in the desk by the end of it. I did split those categories up because in my head they are different, but many people disagree with me. Um, so where do we go next? Well, we get to sort of nowhere really. We've got an idea of what we want to do. Um, I'm not going to show you the actual results, as in like sort of pie charts and stuff here today, because simply I've not actually had time to get them back to our staff yet. It's their survey, it's their data, so they need to see it before I stand here and say to the world, but we will be sharing it in the long run. And to be honest, there's nothing there that, as I say, we wouldn't guess already. Um, you know, there's things there that are quite encouraging to see that some, you know, the participation rate was not bad, could have been better, but people were commenting and giving us back comments throughout that. One person, I think, kind of went through and maybe sort of criticised the entire survey. Doesn't matter, you know, at least they took part of it. A few people probably went through and said, no, don't want to answer everything just because they wanted to look at the survey itself. Again, that doesn't matter. In terms of the equality and diversity questionnaire and survey that we've done, I would like to repeat it at some point soon and then keep regularly repeating it to see how the trends and patterns change and see whether the, if we keep doing it more people might take part and believe in it and trust it. There was a lot of people saying we don't want to give that data because you will be able to identify me from it. Well I don't see that data. If it's two people in our company who could potentially access that raw data, I just see the statistics, I just see the, the graphs and stuff that come afterwards. Um, so we just need to get people's faith in that as well. <coughs> Another point is that, and this is where I'm going to actually hand over to Angela, is that we, equality and diversity is one route, but we're actually as a company thinking more along the lines of, well, I'm not going to ruin your <laughs> <laughs> So this is where I hand on to you for what one. happens next. Middle one, isn't it? It's bottom one. Okay. Yep, I'm not going to go there. There we go. There we go. So what happens next? Well, first of all, it's, it's thanks to Alex for having spending all that time grabbing that data. I did leave it to her to do a lot of my work because um, I was extremely busy doing many, many other things. But I very much suspect that what the profile that we've found about ourselves is probably similar to most other commercial archaeological units. You know, we are very much a white middle class kind of organisation with, like she says, a bell curve in terms of our uh, age um, diversity. But 
And I really hope that when we do share the data with you, that you'll understand that some of the lessons that we learned, and some of them are quite hilarious. Some of the comments that came out there were very, very funny. Um, and some of them are also quite serious about how we as archaeologists perceive ourselves to be as well. But why have I called inclusivity the journey? Well, if you remember from the very first slide, it's about equality and diversity to fairness, inclusion and respect. And fairness, inclusion and respect is something that Alex and I both signed up to. And it's something that's part of the construction industry, FIR it's called. And we're both FIR ambassadors. Um, and it's because at Wessex we wanted to look beyond the very traditional Equality Act of 2010. I think Theresa mentioned it as well. It's, it's a very, very rigid piece of legislation. It's a very important piece of legislation. And it's designed as employers to make us aware of how we should treat each other. But language it uses, like protected characteristics, are, I think, designed to warn us. They make us scared. And as employers, they make us actually quite scared to involve ourselves with disability. You know, it, it kind of makes us a little bit... Uh, obsessed with its definition and what we need to do to be compliant with it. So we avoid it and therefore we don't engage with it. <coughs> so going beyond uh, equality and diversity, we wanted to refocus the meaning and we chose the fairness, inclusion and respect approach as that. So because of only the short time I've got here, I'm only going to talk about the inclusivity part of this. I mean, but if I give you a sort of the idea of what it is, so the fairness, inclusion and respect, um, what are the benefits to it? Now, they're fairly self-explanatory, but they are about the culture of the organisation by being more open and trusting and respectful, promoting FIR within our organisation, talking about good behaviours, how we talk and act towards one another. Also, understanding that fairness, inclusion and respect can bring massive benefits to us as an organisation by attracting, retaining, recruiting um, our staff so that we don't have to continuously re-employ people. So what I'm going to touch upon is a few things that we've started doing, and hopefully... Um, Oh, sorry. Yeah, hopefully you'll understand some of the things we've been doing. So we talked about the Equalities Act. This is a slide that um, Alex pointed out here. We talked about the nine protected characteristics of quality, which are things like age, disability, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity. But rather than just looking at that, we wanted to move on to something called the waterline of visibility. Um, and these are very, very real and interesting because these are the things that you don't necessarily see as equality and diversity, and they sit below the waterline visibility. So rather than having, say, male or female in gender or sexual orientation, we consider... Sexual, sexuality is more about our unique human makeup, religion and belief, very difficult and emotive subjects, but perhaps we should also include culture, perspectives and beliefs as well. So I'm going to share some of the practical steps that we've been taking um, in, at Wessex in the last, few, uh, last year or so. And one of those is uh, looking at autism in the workplace, and I think Theresa mentioned autism as one of her things, and that, we took it very, very seriously. Um, oops, so why? Why did we choose autism? Well, back in 2015, 2016, we employed a member of staff who went through the usual um, routes, sent an application form in, didn't mark themselves as disabled, don't have to, absolutely no problems with that at all. I got a phone call sort of three months after they were employed saying, Angela, I'm a bit worried. Uh, this person was on a site, they've been asked to leave the site. Why? because they went to sign a, a visitor's in-book and they found this person going through the drawers of the site office. Right, okay, so we took them off the site. A little bit odd, Angela, not quite sure. Is there anything in any of their paperwork? No, nothing in any of their paperwork. Put them on another site in London. And then we discovered that this person had diabetes. Okay, we had a couple of incidents where we had to call out the ambulance because they weren't managing their diabetes. It's incredibly difficult to manage. but. At this point in London, they were working from home and they were there staying with their parents and they were managed to control their diabetes. That job finished, they did okay, and we moved to another project. This project was an away project. And I was getting phone calls. You know, I'm a bit worried, there seems to be a problem, they're not managing it. Okay, well, we looked into it, we looked into sort of making things, and then I was getting some really positive things from the site crew. They are uh, changing the way they're doing things on site to help this person integrate with the site stuff. Like what? Well, they're putting the site archive in one place on a daily basis. They're not moving things. They're making their instructions clearer. They're giving them straightforward, clear instructions. And this is not me who is doing this. This is the site crew, and I was really, really pleased. This person then opened up to the site officer and told them that he has autism. And what a massive breakthrough to actually be able to do that. So they came back to me and said, can you have a research onto the autism? I went onto the Autistic Society. I spoke to people who, who have some knowledge about it, and we put together a, a working document. And I'm more than happy to share it with anybody else after this if you want a copy of it. 
Um, and we put through some very, very practical things. So this one did it. So what does the information pack contain? It contains some definition of what autism is. We get that from the Autistic Society. <coughs> it talks about the challenges that, that people with autism f- are faced on a daily basis. We sort of found some practical. We, we listed those practical ways of making life easier for them on site, also on working away. You know, these aren't children. These are adults. They've gone through university. They have their degrees. They are very intelligent people. We talked about increasing awareness of, with us within an organisation, managing it on site, staying away, deployment, health and safety issues. Recruitment, how we make our recruitment packs easier with the language that we use in our recruitment. And then I put in some references and external links for people today. And people really enjoyed it, they really embraced it. They, they, it got, uh, we put it into our staff newsletter, the links to where it was, we talked about it. We didn't make a big song and dance of it, we took it to this individual who had autism and asked them to have a look through it and for them to feed into it as well. So we really tried to embrace the whole idea of it. And it worked. But has it been a total t- success? No. This person still, we still struggle with this person on, an interpret- on a daily basis, partly because their communication is so difficult that the diabetes has a real effect on them. So some of our projects, the health and safety of them, means that we can't put them onto every single project. So it's not always been a total, total love success. Where it has been a success is that basically our staff have really done, embraced the whole idea of you know, embracing somebody with this kind of uh, problem and making them more aware, and, and it makes them aware, and it makes them better practice as actually as archaeologists. The success for this individual, he actually said to um, our logistics person, this is the longest they've ever been employed by one archaeological organisation. That's pretty good, really. You know, I'll take that one. So we've done that. We also do something called uh, uh, health and wellbeing. We run wellbeing and stress uh, courses in our organisation. We support wellbeing. So we consider how people can support their own wellbeing regarding managing stress within the workplace. And those are, those are designed to understand mental health, develop skills to support other people with Wundaboo, and to manage stress, both in themselves and other people. We talk about supporting staff. We train managers. Uh, we give them sort of uh, day-long sessions about looking at how to manage stress within themselves as well as looking at other people as well. Um, and we train some of our site staff as well. Um, it's about facilitating trust within the working relationships and things like that. So we're, we're doing these kinds of things as well as at Wessex. We have, oh, sorry, to get back a bit. Some of the other things, I don't have any slides for everything. We've got flexible working practices. We are very uh, aware that they're both male and female members of staff work their time around, uh, time around care of dependents. It's not without its strain on an operational deployment, but we recognise that the time and investment that we um, have with our employees it would go to waste if we simply had to re- re- re-employ, retrain, and all those kind of things. We have people who are on term time working only. Um, which allows a flexi- flexibility to working hours. Some people work four hours one day, six hours the next day, five hours a day, and don't work Fridays. It's absolutely fine. It's a pain. As the HR director, I tell you, it's an absolute pain. But we can do it, and we do do it, and we encourage everybody. We have people who work from home when they need to. Uh, we have flexible home working, so they can work from home on a, a, a particular day, we put it into practice, or they can be flexible about it and say if they need to take, they need to work from home on a Wednesday one week, Friday the next week, we don't put it into their contract, and we will allow them to do that as well. We encourage a flexible approach where possible, and that includes our site staff as well. We try and encourage a flexible working approach with those. We've moved beyond uh, just looking at straightforward quantifying of, of what an archaeologist is. We've added in desired behaviours to describe our jobs, to make those as important as being able to excavate. I mean, because after all, respecting each other is, in archaeology is about sharing knowledge. So that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to go beyond just sort of listing, listing a whole load of uh, information. So what are the rewards of being more... In- Oops, one. Okay. What are the rewards? Well, we've looked at our audience as well. We've changed our audience. So I've got a, a slide here. It's not particular. I can't see very well. It's very good. Uh, we've uh, engaged recently with um, the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, we ran this session with the uh, men's Alzheimer's group. They're designed to work with uh, men in their very early set stages of dementia. And it was a forum to allow them to socialise with each other, regaining their confidence in social situations. So both Phil Harding and uh, Rachel Brown, who's in there, they put together activities designed to allow a space for discussion, allow them to lead in other topics and things like that. Um, and actually, having sitting in an office sort of two doors down from the uh, seminar room where this was happening last week, uh, it was, it, they, they were having a great time. They, were absolutely, they went through Phil's toolbox and he told them through all the different tools and he told them the story of his toolbox. And they were really, really engaged with the whole thing that was going on. 
what else can we use? We, we're currently in talking with uh, Age Concern. Our Bristol office ran a, 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 an event where we gave them a, a talk about one of our local sites with their Age Concern. Um, and they came back to said, we'd love more. And the project manager emailed uh, myself and uh, his uh, manager and our, our community and outreach and said, can we do more? And we thought, well, let's fund it. We'll fund them to do more. And it's a training platform to people to give presentations. And it's a really, really useful thing to do. And the age concern <coughs> absolutely loved it. They get a bit of knowledge and we share the sort of things that we're doing. So moving forward, fairness, inclusion, respect. It's really important to us. We've learned, we've got masses of challenges ahead of us. Uh, we want to share our knowledge, we want to move forward, and it's really important. We can't continue the way we are. We want to be able to work more collaboratively, breaking down barriers. And our aim is to have an inclusive culture where everyone's uniqueness or diversity is valued and appreciated, and people are supported to do the best job they can. So that's kind of where I finished in terms of what we're doing at Wessex, but I do have, if you're interested, uh, I've got five minutes left, blimey, I talk so quickly, that's unbelievable. Um, it's because Alex didn't do as much as she said she was going to. So I've got three more slides. Because of part of the FIR project that Alex and I both are, we get a lot of work from the construction industry, and I thought it'd be very useful to share some of their initiatives and some of their data if you're interested. So they ran a survey in 2015 about uh, equality and diversity and their kind of things, and they got some really interesting responses from them. 98% of their respondents feel safe at work. 85% uh, of respondents feel comfortable to be themselves at work, but only 72% of operatives. Now, in their case, operatives are the guys out on site. The rest of them are the sort of management side of things. 39% of respondents feel their group of uh, people are treated unfairly or less favourably than others in the workplace. That's a massive amount. This rises to 51%. Half the people who work out on their sites feel that they are treated unfairly or less favourably than others. Uh, responses in small to medium enterprises felt significantly more valued than those in class. And I think that's probably true in most of these. Because you work in a smaller organisation, you do feel that you have a relationship. Now, I think at Wessex, we have, although we're a, a substantial, 285, I think, at my last count, we have got the regional offices. And our regional offices are quite a family orientated, including our biggest office at Wessex, 159 of us, I think. I did the count yesterday. Um, a third response is don't believe their employees are making the most of their skills. And I think that's probably true of us as well. These are two years ahead of us at the moment. Uh, if not more, because they are running these fairness, inclusion, and respect, which gains all these, and that's made up of, I mean, apart from Alex and I, who are the only ones who sit out on the edge of their own heritage, uh, Carillion, Skanska, all these guys who we work with in commercial units. 12% are upset or offended by how people speak or behave at work in banter or swearing, and I think that's probably true of us as well, and we certainly have come across that in ourselves in the last couple of years, the idea that it's okay to say these things, it's okay to use that, and that came up as one of our mm -hmm. uh, uh, free text at the end of our thing, some of the language that, that people in our community are also using, and it's okay to do it. It's not. Oops, sorry, wrong way again. Uh, the culture survey, so it's, it gets smaller because there's lots of data, I was trying to scoop it all in. The perception of 501 construction employees, 202 industry workers, ex-workers, 445 young people, 252 parents, and 150 adults in the general public. So they perceived that the main strengths of their industry was innovation, pride in major projects, protectors work, uh, well, public safety, and that's probably pretty much true of those of us who work in the commercial world as well. The key concerns, and I think this again, it's very true of us, are shared by parents and young people, are work-life balance. Now that's something that's becoming far more common now uh, than it ever was before. Treatment of women, gender pay reporting this year. We have to do gender pay reporting, it's massive. It's, it's, a, it's a very important thing that we have. Like Alex said, we have a 50-50% uh, 50 50 divide at Wessex, and that includes from the top down to the bottom, we are pretty much well represented, so we're not too bad. Uh, there still are issues, don't get me wrong. Treatment of people with disabilities, treatment of people related to sexual orientation and gender identity. The industry holds some of the positive views on itself than outsiders do. So, I have come across in the last few years quite a lot of negative. Uh, impressions from the heritage industry about the construction industry and I think that they understand that there are a lot of people who do think that still back in that 1970s you know the the site hut full of lads mags that's kind of thing it's not probably the case as much anymore as much uh, for women industry industry women response are more negative about the industry's acceptance of women I think that's probably true in archaeology uh, ethnic minorities are negative about industry's acceptance of ethnic minorities we've already established there aren't that many so it's probably true here as well Large firms are more positive about industry culture than smaller firms. I'm not sure about that one. I don't think that one probably relates too much. Uh, but there is widespread support for improvement across all aspects, and I think that's probably true of us. Why we're here today, we are really interested in it. 
and our last slide, oops, sorry, John Day. They looked at agenda professions, they called cloud architecture, and I suspect that's probably quite a good met uh, um, metaphor for us as well. And they probably face similar challenges that we're facing. Very long working hours, putting people off staying in the profession, older established professionals behaving in ways that younger workers perceive as old fashioned, biased, discriminatory, but people having to play their game if they want to progress. I think that's probably still true of us. And the percentage of women in the profession falls gradually from the undergraduate level. I think, again, that's probably true of us as well. Uh, the architect would perceive construction sites as not outright racist, sexist, or racist, as they may have been years ago, but places where trust matters and trust is built through masculine cultural entitlement and associated behaviours, valuing physical strength, and not comfortable places to be out as LGBT. And I think that's probably true of what we think of them as well. So that's where I'm finishing. That's just those very, very few slides, but uh, there we go. That's us. Thank you.